Uh, look up Charles Chiniqui, C-H-I-N-I-Q-U-I. Uh, wrote, wrote a book called The Priest, The Woman, and the Confessional. And it is a tell-all. Uh, a priest, Catholic priest from uh, Quebec, Canada. And, there, I mean, Quebec is a French, was a French colony, so it had Roman Catholic influence. And he spilled the bean. He later came out of the Catholic Church and became a born again Christian. That's why he wrote about it. And he said, "The biggest power that the Vatican has over the people is the confessional, because there they exhibit their power, they express their power. If you don't, if you don't satisfy me, and I don't, if I think you haven't told me everything, you're not going to be forgiven." Yeah, you can't, and the wafer is salvation. If you don't eat the cookie, you can't go to heaven. And it's not an Oreo. It's not a chocolate chip. It's nothing like that. Uh, but that's their power. That, that's, that's how they hold, and that's how these priests got in with all these girls and boys and started molesting them. They got them in the confessional first. So tell God thank you that he brought you out of that slimy pit. Amen. Amen. Well, yeah, let's pray for uh, Sister Rose. She took a pretty hard tumble. She hit her rib, uh, I guess, on the pew. She got her foot caught on something and hit hard. Yeah, and so um, I think I'm going to tell her if she comes into work tomorrow, I'm going to fire her on the spot because she'll try to come in. I know her. And so... Um, but just pray for her that she'll recover from this and uh, pray that God will help her with her pain. And uh, if there's anything wrong, the doctors will find out. Uh, pray for people in my family that are sick. Um, pray for, what else can we pray for tonight? Pray for our church. Pray for the ministry in Kenya. And... Um, so just pray, pray for, especially pray for this Friday. Uh, we already have the place where we're going to meet. There's a church that is a friend of our ministry, our radio ministry, and they're going to open their doors, and uh, they're going to hold the Bible study and then give out uh, portions of food. I found out uh, today that we were able to purchase um, just the corn that we bought. We bought these huge bags full, not a can of corn, but huge bags of corn. Michael said there were 115 kilograms. Well, that is over 250 pounds just of corn, and we have four of them. So that make, we have a half a ton of corn already. And then we're going to buy rice and we're going to buy beans. And um, Maybe we need to send them over a little Mexican spice. Spice it up a little bit. Corn, spicy corn and spicy rice and spicy beans. That would make it better for them. But anyway, um, just pray. Pray for that and pray that God will, uh, if God is in it, that he'll show us. And that he'll show us how often to do this, when to do it, and so on. Uh, but I'm excited about it. I really am. Um, John reminded me, turn to Matthew 25. I had not thought of this, but Matthew 25, how Jesus separated the sheep from the goats was 30... Verse 33, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered and ye gave me meat. That's it. First thing he said. First thing he said was I was hungered and ye gave me meat. Meat means meal. Okay, food to eat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. And then shall the righteous answer, listen to this, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? 
When saw thee we a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? And, or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least, the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. I think too many churches are catering to the wealthy. And we are supposed to be the ones to recognize who are the hungry ones, who are the needy ones. They would be the least in the world's eyes, I guess, of the brethren of Jesus Christ. And that's the ones we're supposed to think of. And so let's just pray tonight. God will bless these that are sick, these that are hurting, these that are, are ailing in some way. And uh, just pray that God will lift them up. And those that, that broke my heart when Kister uh, told Michael and he told me that many of the people in the area where our radio station is go hungry. I know I can't feed everybody. And I wish I, could, I, wish I had Bill Gates' money. And I would try to feed as many people as I could. But we can't save everybody, but we can try to save some. And so just pray that God will continue to bless, all right? Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to start tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and tell him thank you that you already have corn and rice and beans and God has already provided for you. So the reason why our cup runneth over is so others can have what we don't need. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for the mercy that you've given me in my life. Very undeserved. Very, um, no merit on my part. So, Father, I thank you for every day that you have given me with my wife and my family, every day that you've given me with the people of this church, every day that you've given me in your word, and every day spent with you. I thank you for it. I praise you for it. I pray, dear God, that you would bless um, those in Lodoire. Bless the pastors who have uh, volunteered to join in and help us. Bless their churches. I pray, God, that you would just bring increase for them as they lead people to Jesus. Father, I know we have enemies over there. And Father, I've got it. I don't know everything that you know, but I've got it figured that... When you start working in those people's lives, our enemies are going to come against us somehow, some way. Father, it's your work. And Lord, if you wanted to continue on, I trust God that you'll also provide for it, you'll bless it, and you'll protect it. And Father, we just pray, God, that uh, we could minister to the needs of people, Lord, wherever we reach. Father, you would bless them. In blessing them, Lord, it blesses us. Father, we pray for those tonight, many tonight, many in our church, Lord, are ailing, they are sick, they are weak. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help them through it. Lord, it is winter time, and these things happen. Father, be with Sister Rose, such a dear, sweet saint. What a faithful servant to our church. I pray, God, that you would bless her. Give her your grace, and, and Lord, just heal her in her body, take away her pain, and help her to recover easily and quickly. Father, open up your hand to us tonight. Feed us of your word. We have need of that, Lord. It's going to be a long week this week, and we pray, God, that you would just help us through it. Guide us, Father, with your word, and thank you, God, for what it is and what it says and what it does for us in our lives. Help us as we study now, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said... Amen. We are studying the work of devils, and Ephesians 6 gives us the principalities and the powers that we are indeed wrestling against, and uh, in, uh, we've been covering some of the verses that speak of the principalities and powers by name, and these verses tell us that they have no power over us. Again, 
They can press us, oppress us, depress us, compress us. They can scare us. They can just make us weary, but they cannot own us. They cannot take over us. God will not allow it. Amen? So that's what we've been looking at. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, at verse 13, he says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. So, what's the next group of angels or devils in the list that Paul gives in Ephesians? Principalities, powers, and then rulers of the darkness of this world. So look in your Bible. Not only does he mention principalities and powers here, he mentions those who have power over darkness. And we have been taken out of that darkness and put in the light of the Word of God and the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the gospel. Amen? We are partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, he said. We are not in darkness. Very important. Because I preached this uh, several years ago, was uh, preaching a seminar at a friend of mine's church down in Arkansas, and another pastor friend of ours attended, was listening, and, and I mentioned that what the, the way churches now, they're being built, they're building these new buildings, very little light over the people themselves, all the light being on the stage. This is it, and some people may not think that's a big deal, but I'm telling you, it shows what is in their heart. When men love darkness rather than light, he's not just talking about spiritual darkness, he's talking about darkness, darkness. They love darkness rather than light. They would rather be in darkness. And this pastor came up to me, and I talked about that, and this pastor came up to me after that. He said, Brother Mike, he said, I'm glad you mentioned that. He said, I've got a youth pastor. And he said, I love him. He's got a lot of zeal. He's got, but he's wanting to... He's wanting to He's, he's got the, the young people there on Sunday morning having their service. And he is insistent on lowering the lights down for them while, while they have church in there. And he said, I've always felt uneasy about that. Never could figure out why. And it's right there in the Bible. And I said, you need to go back. You're the pastor. You need to go back and deal with that. Do not let these men put anybody in your church in darkness. Amen. We're of the light. We love the light. Turn the lights on. Verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. I, I missed verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Translated. That's the rapture. Translated us. We're going to go from English to heavenly language. Amen. We're going to be translated. Verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, which, underline that, this is why we don't worship idols. The only true and proper image of God is Jesus Christ. And the only true and proper image of Jesus Christ is this book you got in your lap. We're not to have an image of Jesus Christ. Christ, because that's not what he looks like. How do you know? How do you know? Amen. Uh, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So you can under list, underline this part and answer Jehovah's Witness questions or maybe some of the, even the Hebrew roots groups who very subtly reduce Jesus down to a lesser being than God the Father is. Because right, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Christ was a created angel. But that's not possible. Because if by Christ all things were created, what does the phrase all things mean? Everything. So Christ could not be created if through Christ all things were created. He didn't create himself. So he was before the creation. Christ is. Before the creation. Before anything. And when I get to heaven, 
I want to have God sit down with me and detail everything he did before the creation. And it'll take an eternity, but we've got an eternity. Didn't, it, didn't you ever ask that question? What did God do before us? That's deep. I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Uh, for by, anyway, all, if, okay, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Who created Satan? Jesus. Who created the legion that was in that man in Gadarenes? Who created them? Jesus did. And they knew it. Jesus, thou son of the most high God, what have we to do with thee? In other words, well, you come messing with us before the time. Ain't time yet. Don't mess with us now. We still got time. They knew exactly who he was. The devils knew who he was. They, were, they knew that they were subservient to him. They knew that they had to be submissive to him. They hated him, but they knew that they couldn't do anything without his permission. Even devils have to obey the word of God. Remember that. When you're in a bad spot, when you're in, in a mess, and you've got devils tormenting you, give them the word of God. Because it's like some people, and you, as soon as you start talking about the Bible, they're gone. Okay? They cannot handle the Bible says that Jesus cast out devils with his word. All they had to do was speak, and they left. So Jesus was the creator of all... The, so I'll ask you the question, did God create evil things? Absolutely. The Bible said, God said, I create light, I create darkness, I create good, and I create evil. God did that. What does that mean? Well, God planted a tree in the midst of the garden called the knowledge of good and evil. And then God said, don't eat of that tree, knowing that that's exactly what Eve, then Adam, would do. God created evil. God created Lucifer, this exalted angel, and he placed him in such a high position and placed him uh, of such radiant beauty, knowing that his pride would overcome him, and he would say, I want God's throne. God knew that, and God created that. Uh, again, verse 16, the latter part, all things were created by him and for him. They are God's, don't you listen to this, they are God's to do with what he pleases. So, your house burnt down or your car broke down and it's unrepairable or you lost a bunch of money in the stock market or you lost a family member everything belongs to God and he then is able to do with it what pleases him now we have a promise that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So while losing money or losing a house or losing this or losing that is not fun, that is part of the good, the greater good that God is going to do in your life. I've had to learn to trust that. I didn't like it, but I've had to learn to trust that. And I know, at least from what I've seen in my life, the very worst things that have happened to me, by me, or around me, God was able to take those things and make good out of them. And a good that is greater than the loss that I sustained. Did he not do this for Job? Did he not give Job when Job lost everything that he had, when Job even lost the members of his family? Did God not give Job three daughters that the Bible says were the most beautiful women in the whole world? 
Okay? So that's God. What God takes away, I promise you, He will give back greater than what He took away. Never less. Always greater. So verse 17, He is before all things. Who is? Christ. How can he be created? How can he be before himself? Can't. He is before all things, and by him all things, what? What does the word consist mean? You ever mix up dough? Water is very liquidy, right? Pudding. When you put that stir pudding, you you got to stir it all the time. You're going to heat it up, make pudding. You put that pudding mix in there, and you're waiting for it to get to a certain consistency. It's how it's held together. Mashed potatoes need to be clump and need to be tight, not runny. Ugh. Right? So think of that word. And Sterling, I'll give you this. Two magnets... The North Pole's the two magnets. What do they do? You can never... Yeah, look at him. You ought to see what he's doing. He's going... He knows some things. They repel each other. Turn that around. Take the South Pole of a magnet, a bar magnet. Okay, now watch. Everything in this room is made up of atoms... You know, oxygen is an atom, uh, hydrogen is an atom, iron is an atom, gold is, is an element, they all have atoms. And depending on what number element they are, they have a certain number of protons in the core and a certain number of electrons go, spinning, rotating around them. The question is, since those neutrons, when you get up to 50 neutrons... I don't know what 50 is on the periodic table, but when you get an element with 50 protons in the center of it, how is it that those protons stay together? Because bundled together, they should repel one another, right? Because they have a positive charge, and what is it that's keeping the electrons away from the core and the neutrons push together in the core of it. They should, the electrons should all jump and find a neutron and, and, or a proton and, and stick together. That's not what happens. So what is holding those protons together? Jesus. That's what it says. By him all things consist. So I got a little theory. That on the last day... Of Earth's history. Peter said the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. So what I think is Jesus is going to go, let go. And everything is going to dissolve. Because that's what it says. It will be dissolved. Right now, Jesus is what's holding everything together. Now, you say, what does that got to do with anything? Your life. Who is it that's holding your life together? Who is it that's holding your family together? Who is it that holds this church together? Including all of those. See, we're the protons. They're all the electrons spinning around us. Okay? But what is holding... Because sometimes we don't agree with each other here, but what is holding us together? What is binding us together? When he said all things consist... This book is holding us all together. Oh, I love that. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That means every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Now look at chapter 2, verse 9, Colossians. Mm, boy, I like this. For in him, Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, uh, that's why when you look at like John 1, 
And verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You have all three there. Um, because all parts of the Godhead are manifested in Jesus Christ. Isaiah, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I'll give you eight seconds. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Verse 6, Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born. I can, I can never read that, but I hear Handel's Messiah in there. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the, notice Jesus is called the everlasting Father. Well, how can Jesus, the Son, be the Father? I don't know. I don't know. I'll just believe it. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, back here, it says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's Christ, the Son, and yet, he's the Father, but I know that that Father is in heaven. When Jesus came up out of the water, when he was baptized, you heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. And then Isaiah, turn, turn two chapters later to Isaiah 11, and you see in him, there shall come, verse 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. You have, have the seven spirits of God here, which is the seven spirits of God are with Jesus and they are Christ he, and, and they are the word. The seven spirits are Jesus and the seven spirits are your Bible. Okay? And yet they're separate. The spirit, the word, and the father or the Holy Ghost, the father, the word, and the Holy Ghost. These three there are three of them, and yet there's one of them. I do not understand it, but I believe it. Okay? And you can too. Don't try to change it to make yourself understand it. Just believe it. Amen? So in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He's the head of it. He's the boss. Means that every devil that comes after you if Jesus says, leave him alone, then they have to leave him alone. Amen? There are some out there, you'll see them on the internet, who are all the time telling people, you've got to, pro you've got to cast these demons off of you. You must pronounce them gone. You must speak boldly. You have power to get rid of them. I don't. I always tell God to do it. God, I got devils swimming all over me. God, I'm, I'm about to lose it. God, get them off of me. And God always does. So I just, I don't know. I know, I know Paul did it. I know Jesus did it. But I'm, I'm just kind of like, I know that story. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? So I don't pretend to be, can somebody shut that door? I, there's a computer. Find out what computer's going nuts back there and find out what's going on with it. But anyway, um, I don't pretend to be of some substance, okay? So if I've got devils on me, I go tell the boss of them because he is the head of all principality and all power. Verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Bear, uh, in putting off the body, that's what this means. Circumcision made with hands is earthly circumcision, like a Jewish rabbi would do, a, a moil. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Only Christ can do that one, and that means putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The symbolism is re taking off the outer layer 
to reveal that which is inward. Did I say that well enough for everybody to understand what I'm saying? That's what that is. That's what that means. So it has to do with taking this flesh off of us so that our soul, our spirit, the new man in us can rise up. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism. We, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. So who baptizes you? God does. You're not baptized by a man to be saved. You can only be baptized by God to be saved. Because that's what it says. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. It is God that raises you up. Not the, not the pastor, not the bishop, not the priest. It's God. Pan, that book you gave me. And I love that. Yeah, you're not getting it back just yet, okay? She's got a book, and I, I'm just honorary enough to copy this and distribute it, because it's an old book, but it's written by a man who used to be a dyed-in-the-wool Lutheran. And Lutherans are saved by works and grace. That's what they think. That's what they teach. And this man came out of the Lutheran church, and he says, I, I won't tell you what it says. It is awesome. The, the, the analogy that he makes with Hagar and Sarah is just it's phenomenal. I love it. God called that man out. Amen? You're not saved by works. Being, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh... I have an idea for a Watchman broadcast called Night of the Living Dead, the zombie apocalypse. Because what happens is all these people out here that are lost, they're living dead. They're dead already. Some of them are twice dead. The Bible says that. You know what that means? That means that they have already got a place being held for them in the lake of fire. They are not ever going to get saved. Never. So anyway, you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled, here it is, spoiled principalities and powers. Tell me what that means to, to spoil principalities and powers. Tell me what that means. Huh? Huh? Yeah. You put a really good apple pie or coconut cream pie or something like that in the refrigerator. And you say, man, I'm going to eat that thing. And then you step on the scale the next day and you're going, there's no way I can eat that. So you go back a month later thinking... You know, I lost a few pounds. Maybe I can get a piece of that pie. And you look in there, and it's got mold all over it. What do we say? It's spoiled. But what happened? The mold ate what was going to be yours. To the victor go the spoils. In the day of Jehoshaphat, when, they, when God put them on the hill to sing, and God brought the three armies down, they all destroyed one another. And when their armies traveled, they, those guys brought everything. They brought their idols, they brought their gems, they brought their gold, they brought food with them. Because I mean, when you compass a city, you might be there six or eight months to starve everybody out. And the Bible says that they were three days gathering the spoils. Which means that it belonged to them, the enemies, but now that they're dead, the Israelites can go and gather up all the stuff that was theirs. So having spoiled principalities, here's what I think. That at one time, the habitation of these devils was heaven. Just like the Canaanites... And the Hittites and the Perivites were the inhabitants of Canaan land. They possessed that land. 
But because of their wickedness, God said, I'm going to cast them out and I'm going to move you in their place. So I think God is going to kick out one third of the angels out of heaven and I get to move in their house. See, I kind of like that. That's kind of, that's my, that's my take on it. I could be wrong. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Okay? Now, I have a couple theories on that. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But the bottom line is, whatever principalities and powers are against you, Christ is the boss. And he's always the boss. This nonsense, charismatic church teaches that they have more power than God does unless you give God the power to get rid of them. That's baloney. That's nonsense. That's not biblical. It's not right. They say that God lost dominion over the earth when Adam sinned. Now Satan's got the whole planet and God's just going, what am I going to do? That makes me angry. I've got a God that's more powerful than all of the evil gods and devils and principalities and powers put together. Amen? Let me say this, and I'm going to cut you loose because I, want to, I don't want to get this started tonight. But turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. And let's look at this, this third group. And then next Sunday night we'll, we'll, we'll dive into this. I started working on this, and boy, I tell you what, I was getting more out of it than I ever thought that was in there. In Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood in verse 12, but against principalities and powers, so we've dealt with that, and we see that Christ then is the ruler and the head over all principalities and powers. And then number three, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So I, I actually have a verse up there on the screen that says what they are. The moon and stars to rule by night. For his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, 9. So, the moon and the stars rule by night. They are the rulers of the darkness of this world. There was a man that was so out of his mind in the days of Jesus that the Bible called him a lunatic. Some people say that in times of a full moon, cops will tell you this. ER people, nurses and doctors, will tell you this. It's a full moon out. People are going nuts. Is there something to that? Biblically. I think the moon and the stars rule by night. Okay? And I think these are... Um, Rulers of the darkness of this world. So now consider this. How much power does the moon have at night? All of it. When the moon is full, you can't miss it. The moon has total power at night. Until when? 6 a.m. Because when the sun shows up, the moon loses his power. Amen? No more power. He does not have an authority. The stars lose their authority because the sun showed up. Amen? That's where we're going next week. Stand your feet. The moon and stars to rule by night for his mercy endureth forever. I just made that up. That's pretty good. I won't remember it, but that's pretty good. Somebody ought to make a song, a song out of Psalm 136. Just to remind us that His mercy endureth forever. Amen. Father, I love you. I thank you, God. This book, I love it. I love this book. It's, it's got everything in it. Every understanding, no matter how shallow or deep that we can have, it's all in this book. We need not man to make other books that are going to give us anything better than what this book already provides. We just need 
one book, one light in the daytime to guide us, not two, not three. And Father, I know something very simple, that when the sun rises, the moon goes away. And God, I understand a little bit about what that means. And so, Father, when the moon is ruling over us at times of the darkness of our life, may the sun rise and make him go away. Father, bless your people tonight. Lord, please be with all the people here that are sick, that are ailing, that are aching. God, please heal them or give them something better than healing them. Be with Sister Rose, Lord, she's on my heart. God, I pray, God, that you would just watch over her and, Lord, just ease her of her pain. I pray, God, that nothing is broken. I just pray, God, that you would just give her healing and give her comfort. Father, do that for our sister, please. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.